was. Now this is uh, is another uh, unique uh, uh, psychological concept that occurs in in Buddhism in Buddhist texts. Now uh, uh, let me tell you the definition. The reflective force is a mental force that conditions the physical body. A reflective force is a mental force that conditions the physical body. Or you could say uh, the function of the physical body. So it's a, it's a psychological force. It's a mental force. So the reflective force is a mental force that conditions the physical body. So, so the common sense is that the body and mind are mutually, uh, um, uh, so uh, they are mutual uh, in terms of function. Their function is mutual. mutual. But at this point we are talking about uh, a kind of mental force that we know already. So uh, we are done with the definition. Um, that's why, if, I, if you want me to repeat one more time, reflective force is a mental force that conditions the physical body. So uh, if I add more, because this, uh, this is this is part of, this is the bottom line. Um, so now you know what mental force means, the definition of it, and then uh, tomorrow mind commands the body to sit, sleep, stand and or move. We know for sure it's a common sense that we know that the connection between the connection between our body and the mind, the mind and the body. But there should be the whole point of this class today is to, just to come up with some uh, some uh, terms so that you would know what exactly it is. So the mind commands the body to sit, to stand up, sleep, or move. When the will to move arises, will dash to dash move will to move. When the will to move arises, mind-made version of the physical body pervades the entire physical body. When the will to move arises, meaning when we feel like moving, like sitting, like standing, like sleeping, like reclining, uh, running, at that point what happens is that the mind-made version of the physical body pervades the entire physical body and do not uh, mistake it with the uh, psychic body it's a different term so it has a connection with the psycho psychic body but but this is simply your entire physical body or in case the movement includes your in entire physical body and so that uh, that uh, reflective body uh, takes the, uh, takes over the physical body, but actually, um, it is the physical body that you move around. It's the physical body that moves, but there's another uh, reflective body within that is mind made. For example, when I let's say I have. A a uh, problem with my vision. Right? Now, I feel I'm now looking for my glasses, specs. Okay, they are on the table. And then I immediately I decided to wear them. And what I did was in a split of a second I would uh, pick it and wear. Then I feel comfortable. So I call it the Buddhist psychology. It's because of the reflective force. Reflective force can be easily understood in terms of uh, 
mind, a mind-made uh, body parallel to our physical body. But again, at this point, do not mistake it uh, with uh, the psychic body. But when you discuss, uh, like, uh, um, like the psychic psychic body uh, in terms of our supernatural ability, at that point we will discuss that. But it, it is no way relevant to this class. We don't uh, talk about uh, supernatural things in this class. Otherwise, it become a uh, class on religion. This is simply to understand our emotions, our feelings, our physical body, our mind, our our uh, our selfhood. So this is another lesson on uh, self-reflection. When you know these terms, and then when you when you move your limbs, when you move around. Uh, when you put your body in different positions and you will you will be able to uh, do that uh, with awareness now uh, um, for example let's look at a uh, few situations now uh, you are uh, now uh, driving back home on the motorway highway freeway or expressway wherever and then you uh, your exit is 10 miles away and all of a sudden, there's a uh, uh, warning about uh, lane reduction. And the traffic gets uh, piled on a sing in a single lane. And you have to, it's bumper to bumper traffic. And that's, that's when you get a nature's call. Um, so that uh, what happens is, uh, you need to respond to that nature's call right away. But then what happens is, I can't do that right now. How many more miles were the my exit is 10 minutes, uh, sorry, 10, uh, 10 miles away. And then uh, there's, a, there's no uh, exit nearer, uh, closer, so that you have to wait. Uh, it's more disastrous that there's a lane reduction due to construction work. So the, all the traffic are moving into a single lane. So it's, uh, it's piling up on a sing in a single lane. So, so you find it difficult to, but at the same time, because, uh, and at times you put the blame on, why did I drink so much water today and in my workplace? Usually I don't do that. My karma, whatever I did that today. And lots of people have told me, they get the nature's call, uh, whenever they get caught up in the traffic. Heavy traffic. Right? So this is, one example um, and then what happens somehow you need you you need lots of uh, um, tolerance it's, it's pointless to hate the situation because there's no way to do that and if you answer the nature's call on the road, on the side of the highway or the motorway that could invite more trouble when the police see you doing that uh, so that uh, uh, then what happens now let's say two hours later right? and then you get home and then you open the gate and you open you open the door and you go in even if you could uh, wait like uh, two hours caught up in the traffic uh, going through lots of pain uh, so sort of, uh, frustration unable to answer the nature's call. Even if you could wait two hours, two good hours or more than that, um, you can't wait until you sit on the toilet sheet. And one day when I told that one boy, he said, okay, Bandit, it always happen I pee in my pants. <laughs> um, so, uh, and then how do we hold, hold our uh, muscles, as you know, in scientific terms, right? So the brain, there are the brain has specific uh, cells. Brain cells govern specific uh, uh, areas of our body, muscles. So that when the nature's call is there, and then uh, so you usually immediate response, your brain wants to answer that call, but there's no way to do that. Then that is when you use the reflective force. Reflective force means you create this one. You move, 
you uh, how to say disconnect yourself from the situation so that now uh, the nature's call is part of your physical selfhood and you need to answer that otherwise it could be there could be an emergency as well right? so uh, what, what happens is you create a parallel parallel situation in your head well um, so and then uh, like you pretend there's no heavy traffic here I'm not caught up in the heavy traffic so the traffic there's no lane reduction the traffic are not uh, it's not uh, piling up in a single lane so I can I can uh, stand that and you tell you once you are convinced what happens psychologically and uh, neuropsychologically as well and then uh, so that uh, you get your stress frustration reduced so you can wait but again you lose you uh, uh, give up on, on that when you uh, reach your house your home but again that's why but you have to uh, extend your reflective force few more minutes to make sure that uh, uh, that there doesn't occur in an accident so this is one example we all, that is called reflective force one example second another example is uh, coping with hunger now when you are extremely hungry <coughs> so immediate response uh, the way your body responds, uh, the immediate response of the body to your hunger is that you need to eat something. And at times, you get, uh, usually get, and then uh, now let's say it's lunch time. Probably it's around 3, 3 a.m. 3 p.m. And then, uh, then you tell yourself, well, I had been suffering from gastritis for many years because I skipped breakfast. But this is not, this is, this is not breakfast time. This is not even lunch time, it's close to supper. Now, but what happens is, no sooner do you tell yourself that you got gastritis years ago, while you have recovered now, and then uh, your belly, your stomach start responding, as though it is the morning and uh, you are now uh, feeling uh, uh, so the, the gas problem. And what happens at that point is, um, always, whenever we fail to uh, respond uh, to uh, uh, our emotional, especially our physical, we are talking about the physical body at this point, not mind. Uh, so the, the biological needs. So uh, what, what we do immediately is that we use our past at the point of reference. Uh, so in the case of that, uh, yourself getting caught up in the traffic. Well, uh, had I left my workplace 10 minutes early because I couldn't do that. My co-worker wanted me to stay and talk to because she had uh, a problem to discuss with me. Uh, so that, uh, and then you also at times uh, get frustrated with the people. And you involve, grab lots of people into the situation. Right? But, uh, and in the case of hunger also. And then, uh, so you feel hungry. There's nothing to grab and eat, so that you have, there's no choice but you wait until you make it uh, until you get home or get to a, a fast food place, so that you can grab something and eat, um, so that uh, you can satisfy your hunger. Let's look at another one: cold weather. And then you, uh, when you read the Siddhartha's biography, Siddhartha, as you know. Uh, the Prince Siddhartha, who, who would later become the Buddha. Right? Uh, so that uh, the royal comfort he had was such that he had uh, three palaces. He has summer palace, winter palace, and then spring palace. Uh, three palaces. And then, uh, so in the, uh, let's say now, when he lived in the summer palace, uh, all there were, he was surrounded by the, the interior was full of murals uh, depicting uh, uh, waterfalls, uh, beautiful bodies of water, rivers. Uh, why is that? Because when he looked around, all his the house interiors full of uh, uh, those scenes, pictures depicting uh, cold weather. 
So that what happened. Now it is extremely hot. When he looked around and he felt uh, peaceful. So that is the psychology, ancient psychology of interior design. Ancient psychology of interior designing. So, uh, and when, whereas when he was in the into winter time, and he had uh, his interior full of in, in, inside his uh, the interior of his uh, winter palace uh, was full of uh, murals depicting uh, uh, so that uh, fire. When he saw the fire, and uh, so that uh, he he didn't feel uh, cold. He wasn't cold, but he felt the warmth. He felt like he is getting himself uh, warmed, so that uh, in order to get yourself warm up. Now, uh, so that is, uh, I was looking for because somebody asked me whether, uh, whether he want, whether there is some uh, some insights uh, on uh, interior design. That's when I came back. I, all of a sudden, this thing struck and struck me. Okay, why not? Prince Siddhartha had three, three palaces. And we also do that a lot nowadays. In the winter time also, I, I used to do that in, in Canada. Once I lived in, I studied in a, in a university in Montreal, Canada. That time the weather was minus 56, minus 60. Uh, I only had my eyes open. Uh, if you stay uh, one minute outside and you get nose bleeding. But inside my car, uh, but uh, so that uh, I felt I was cold even in my room. What I did was uh, instead of putting more and more uh, blankets on me, what I did was I only put one layer of blanket, I wrapped myself in the blanket and then I had deep breath and I meditated on fire. I meditated on fire. Even today I do that. So that uh, warmed me up. So that uh, it was then uh, less cold that I felt. So that is uh, another example. Now uh, the reflective force. Now uh, any any questions at this point about the reflective force? Um, no, no, no party terms. Exactly, yeah. That's, that's fascinating, yes, because you reinforce yourself. Yeah, because he then uh, reinforce himself uh, to be someone with a different identity. He was no longer a king, but a mendicant monk, a uh, traveling monk, depending on the arms offered by the, the common people. And he would go on arms round. He had to beg for food. Right? So that's why then he changed it. So, uh, uh, yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, that's, that's a reinforcement. We reinforce our identity. Uh, so, so that we can, uh, and then it happens uh, to us a lot because if you only go to uh, posh restaurants, because only in the UK do I use the word uh, posh, right? because I always hear that word, especially in this area, Chisik. People say Chisik is a posh area. And so recently, someone said that. Then I said, uh, when you get a flat tire, or the sound from the flat tire also sounds like posh. <laughs> Uh, so, when you, let's say, you only um, eat at, uh, dine at uh, highly rated uh, restaurants and then, so to most people it's a class thing as well. So there's no way to, there's no one because you are now driving through a, a rural area, the countryside and so all of come across uh, some uh, uh, little restaurants or the eating, uh, food place. Right. Even if uh, it's good food and there are people uh, enjoying and they, they are enjoying. Let's say you have a uh, little restaurant is full of customers. Meaning it's a popular restaurant. Meaning the food must be good. But when you take the first bite, you would find the food awful. Nothing wrong with the food. Why? Because you have only eaten in uh, highly rated restaurants and you would always tell. And then what happens is you revisit your memories and then you look at your social identity uh, of being someone who would only dine at uh, uh, highly rated restaurants. And so what happens is uh, your negative reflective force. 
That's why the reflective force both good and bad. Your negative reflective force, um, so that overrides um, your hunger, your taste buds. Even though the food is good, and then what happened? Then what happened? Well, look at them. You look around, probably one of your family members is telling, why, um, uh, so that, why are you angry? Because you know what? We are extremely hungry. There's no, it's no time to be angry because we are hungry. You should, there's a saying, right? And a hungry man is an angry man. But at that time you got food. But you are angry because the food is not good enough. And so, wow, then you just think about everyone else enjoying the food and if you are really uh, into uh, uh, convincing yourself that this is the best restaurants in, this, uh, in the countryside and then uh, when you, uh, then you go back to eating and uh, you will, for sure, you will um, find a second bite very different than the first bite. That is because of negative reflective force and then you the positive reflective force. Again, reflective force is just like a parallel selfhood. That's what we do all the time. We always uh, revisit our past uh, experience, past memories, and then, uh, and then immediately we try to justify our negative approach. Because we, we never wanted that, we have never been in that situation. So, uh, and at, at the same time, so that is where the wrong application is, the wrong comparison. We always do that. And then, uh, so, at that point, uh, when it comes to consumerism as well, you don't drink the water, actually you drink the brand first. You don't wear the, the new shirt, tea, t-shirt or your dress, your trousers, you first uh, wear the brand. And so, so that is when, uh, and they said, uh, uh, so, say, okay, now you go out without your shirt uh, tucked, shirt untucked, so that uh, it falls uh, and it covers the, uh, so the, uh, so the waistline, and so that nobody sees the band, uh, so the, what that, uh, the band name on your pants, right, and so that, and uh, that you are okay. I know some, some people do that a lot. When they dress up, they try to, uh, if it is a cheap brand, they try to cover that up. They cover it. Because they never want others to see that. But the good thing about this also, covering is that when you cover it, nobody sees that and nobody knows which brand it is. So, uh, and that's, the, that's uh, in marketing psychology also when it comes to, because anything psychological I love, anything. So, and then we consume, we consumed uh, the band means, because we maintain, um, we conceptualize everything in the way that such conceptualization uh, pleases us, brings us uh, solace, happiness. So, we don't actually drink the water. First we, consume, first we consume the brand. I think in, on different occasions I mentioned that at times when I work with children, I use that. I, in children's retreat, in the morning I uh, give them each a bottle of water. Uh, so, I, uh, so in the morning I remove uh, the label. And then I mix the bottles. I make sure that uh, uh, I use the uh, same uh, uh, shape of the bottle that uh, uh, produced by, the, I mean, uh, so that comes from different uh, companies, um, so different brands. And so when I ask them to drink the water, and there's no label, they simply drink the water. And thereby I make them uh, to obey the first, uh, the first step of uh, consumption, so that is consuming the brand. And during the day for lunch, I give them a, a bottle of water each, but this time, um, so with the label. And so what they do is, and they don't know what, what brand it is, they take uh, a moment or maybe a minute also just to look at each other's brands, 
and then those who go the cheaper brand make a face uh, while the best best brand the better one and they are they are so happy they even tease the, uh, uh, the uh, anyone else sitting close to them and say hey hey you know what I got the best one uh, so but in the morning at breakfast uh, they didn't have that agony why is that because I prevented them from first consuming the brand name but during the day, I mean at, at lunch I purposely, so I, I let them consume the brand first. So in the morning, they first consume the brand, then the water. At lunch, they first consume the brand and the water. In the morning, they had no chance to consume the brand. So that is how, uh, that's how every, day, every moment, within a split of a second. Uh, so our, uh, so the reflective force can uh, create uh, chemical imbalance our body. It can be chemical imbalance. So, so it is based on our mind. So you can correct that. And then, uh, so when I was child, I was allergic to tomatoes. But you know what? Now my favorite thing is tomato. What happens was when I was in the university, but I, but to make sure that there's no uh, how to say. Uh, allergy condition is allergy condition the kind of genetic or biological, uh, not psychological. Then, it's, then, then that would be a different story. And then I had this uh, tomato allergy, and then one psychologist uh, in the area he talked to me. And then what happens was, when I was like as young as like seven years old, I uh, I just uh, took a bite of uh, beautiful and gorgeous tomato, red. But uh, with the bite, I also took a bite of uh, warm inside. It was rotten. So ever since, uh, I didn't know that. Uh, I had uh, hated tomato from that moment on, onwards. But then he asked me a lot of story. Why, why you, because there was no, uh, I wasn't actually allergic to tomato. But it was a mental condition not a genetic condition, not a biological condition. So now, uh, tomato is my favorite. Drink tomato juice, eat tomato as a fruit or cook, no problem. So, uh, whereas I am allergic to papaya, I don't need papaya. Um, so, and then when I went to, uh, once I ate papaya, and then I went to my uh, GP and he told me that, uh, he checked my body and said, okay, you are, it's, it's, a, it's, not a, it's not a mental condition. You are actually allergic to papaya. So why, why I noticed that was some, people, some of my friends had given me mixed uh, papaya into my uh, uh, fruit juice in small uh, quantities. And then I immediately I felt I got sick. So, whereas uh, my sister, she had mixed uh, tomato. Uh, into my uh, into a curry that she cooked, and I had I consumed uh, that curry, but I didn't I, I didn't feel any allergy condition. Why is that? The tomato thing was a mental thing, whereas uh, the the papaya thing is a biological thing. So there are limits also, but still you can even deal with uh, biologically biological allergy conditions uh, to a certain extent. I'm not saying that. My GP in Canada told me that. He's originally from India. He traveled to India uh, like a few months, go to India every and spend for, there for meditation with the Himalayas and meditate. Uh, so that uh, so he told me that the first the first time he went back to India many years later, first time in many years, he couldn't eat uh, anything made in India. Why? Because he had programmed his mind in a way to believe that uh, uh, the food was uh, not hygienic. So, but later, actually it was nothing. To me, there's no problem. I went to India and ate in different places. There's no problem. What I did was, the people who joined me said that if you go to India, go to Sri Lanka or in certain countries, at times you have to be very careful when you eat. 
But no sooner did I land at the airport, I told myself, okay, I don't have to worry, I'm going to eat, I see those people. So that, uh, you wouldn't believe, it's funny that everyone else, I was healthy, everyone else got sick. So we had a long meditation session at Bodh Gaya and I, we talked about uh, food allergy due to reflective force, negative reflective force. You always, immediately, uh, you, uh, you reinforce yourself through your past experience and then uh, so that you always, when you believe uh, that, uh, that you have eaten the wrong food, that you are in the wrong situation, Actually, then what happens is, even if the situation is not uh, detrimental, uh, harmful, but still you feel, you get frustrated, you may even fall sick. So, uh, and then when it comes to uh, uh, the reflective force, there are, there's a natural way that our body responds to uh, uh, situations. So that, uh, see, the, that is called stormy response. Stormy response is natural. The Buddha talks about the sunshine response. They are antonyms, right? Uh, storm and sunshine. In the stormy weather, it's all dark, uh, terrible, gloomy. It's like, it's ghostly. Whereas after the storm, so you see the sunshine. And then, so you feel peaceful. It's all calm. Your surrounding is peaceful. So that is why sun, sunshine. Why we use the term sun, sun, sunshiny response as opposed to uh, uh, the stormy response is that uh, Buddha recommends that when you, whenever you go through emotional problems, you need to go to, uh, um, out, uh, just go out and uh, spend some time uh, in the sun. And then, uh, so, uh, I think uh, there is what is called this uh, dark room syndrome. I wonder whether I mentioned that in one of my, in my previous sessions. Whenever you have emotional problems, people would love to lock, them, lock themselves up in a room with lights turned off so that you keep yourself in the dark. Why? Because even if uh, you don't, everyone else, even your family members don't know what you are going through, that uh, you think that the entire world already knows that you are going through that. So, uh, so that is why most people, uh, so that you uh, and Buddha recommend that you never uh, spend time in, uh, in the dark when you have emotional problems. You will never have a relief. That's called a dark room. Uh, it could be a syndrome, dark room syndrome. You lock up, up, you lock yourself up in a dark room, and you you hardly come out. You disconnect everyone else uh, uh, from your life, and nobody wants. You never want to talk to anyone because. Uh, but at this point, if you can make it, I have done that a lot because I know people from different backgrounds. In America, what happens is when they they call me for a counseling session. What I do, one of the first things that I would do, the first step all would be that I ask them um, to join me to go to a park or to a ravine, go for a walk. And that is called necessary distraction. That's called the necessary distraction. Even though in, uh, we use distraction in Buddhist meditative terms, my meditation terminology, a distraction has a negative connotation. Actually, that is called the negative distraction. You need to move yourself away from the situation that uh, continues to uh, torture you. So, and then that's at that point, you need to go to the sun sunshine. And then, uh, even the Buddha did that. When he was physically tired, he would go into a quiet place and then meditate. There's no purpose, and because he, he has achieved the permanent peace. But still, he is enlightened in his head, just to say in, in simple terms. His mind is enlightened.
but not his physical body. In uh, strict, in, in religious terms, you call that okay, because uh, even though Buddha is enlightened, but he still has to face his past karma, because karma is partially responsible for the creation of his physical body. Right? So there is called karmic diseases, karmic uh, illnesses. So that is that is what you that's that you think about. But simply think uh, think about uh, the Buddha's uh, physical illness in secular terms and look at that. Now physical body, you cannot enlighten your physical body. It is skin, flesh, blood, and the other thing. Um, so that uh, um, so the, you mentioned a very interesting term that today. I forgot that skin something. About to talk about self food. In the kitchen, you said that, yeah. Within the skin, yeah. Within the skin, uh, that is our self food. Right. So, uh, um, so, and then, uh, so when, when, I, when I, I, when I, I have my back pain, uh, uh, back at times I get it back. So, uh, instead of cutting through the skin first, and then I see the true nature of my physical body, then I start from my uh, skeleton, from my bones, and then come out. I sit there, because otherwise, uh, if I can, I directly cut through, uh, emotionally cut through my physical body, and uh, access my bone, my skeleton, and say to myself, I'm not asking to practice that, this is my personal practice. And then every time I start my start scanning my physical body and then applying vipassana into my physical body, my physical selfhood. By the time I scan, uh, visualize my uh, skeleton, my pain start going away. It is beneath the skin, but uh, before the skeleton. Um, so. It's a difference to that that you have osteoarthritis as well that affects your physical, uh, your, your bones as well. But in general, whenever I have negative uh, um, feelings of my physical body, I uh, start scanning my physical body from, the, uh, from my skeleton and slowly I, I come out of it. So that, uh, and that reflective force helps me. Uh, it helps me uh, to cope with my pain, back pain. And I, I know for you it is it's a, it's due to a muscle spasm. I got a torn muscle. So, uh, close to the spine. Uh, so the spine wasn't affected. It's not, it's, it's, got, it's it wasn't damaged. But I simply got a, uh, a torn muscle. So I watch my diet as well. Why? Because the torn, the torn muscle is permanent. Uh, so what happens is, if I put on weight, there could be a fat build up uh, in, uh, so in, inside the torn area, within the torn area of the muscle. Now, as I said, when I move the muscles, it would, that would cause extreme pain. So what happens I, I also think about my diet. That's something that we're going to talk about the next. The mind itself cannot heal your physical body. You need to listen to your physical body itself as well. Now, when it comes to stormy response, there are, we, at this point, under stormy response, we are going to discuss what is called, uh, what it, uh, the contributive, the contributive tendency of infatuation. Sorry, but the term is too long. The contributive tendency of infatuation. A certain tendency that contributes um, towards uh, um, towards uh, how to say having uh, a negative uh, response to physical body. So that is called a stormy response. By the way, stormy re response again means that you respond uh, to your physical body, whether or not your body is in pain or the body is asking you to demanding you to feed it. Could be an illness could be hunger, uh, could be the fact that uh, you, you, got too mu you are hyper, you got too much energy, 
you could be either energized or you could be enervated. In either case, you feel like uh, uh, responding to your body in a way that it leads to long-term negative, uh, long-term uh, health conditions that could create lead to uh, health problems in the long run. So that is called a uh, stormy response. It's shaky. As though you are a tornado, you are take, uh, taken, uh, uh, when, when you are a tornado, I, I, because I live in Florida, I always use the, the hurricane analogy and tornado analogy. I had, when I was in my house, I had uh, hurricane shields. I had my rented house uh, covered with hurricane shields. And when, whenever I heard, uh, when, during meditation sessions, I always use the tornado analogy. Well, now I close my eyes and visualize a tornado coming towards me and it would pick anything its way, right? Houses, cattle, cars, vehicles, anything. So strong. So it's a very strong tornado. And then I say to myself too, when my body is asking for something, either because I'm going through some pain or because my body is asking for something else, and then if I respond uh, to my body's needs or respond to the demand uh, from my body, physical body, uh, when I respond to the urges, physical urges, and then if I satisfy, if I struggle to satisfy my body, either because I just want to forget my pains or because I just want to satisfy my uh, hyper, hyper energy, and then, uh, so, um, so, as lay people, and we can understand it very, very well in, in terms of uh, lustful feelings, like sexual feelings and all that, right? And you feel when you are, when sexual energy takes you over, or, uh, and then you get hyper, actually. Well, you get hyperactive, your body gets hyperactive. And then when you are sick, and you, you, your body, gets, becomes weak. Uh, when the se sexual energy takes you over, you get energized. When you are ill, as a result you go through pain, you get your body enervated. Opposite, you get weakened. So at that point, either way, what we, but we need some immediate solace, immediate relief, remedy. Um, so, and so that uh, you want to do something with which you can get yourself infatuated, like intoxicated. Now, uh, in just to make it simple, I know lots of my friends, they drink a lot when they are happy. They, the same people, they drink a lot when they are unhappy. So that uh, I noticed, uh, I did some research also. Um, so, uh, in certain countries. People always uh, look for uh, an opportunity to drink. Why? You know what? I am so happy, so I need to drink. I am so sad, so that I need to drink. I have so many friends, I am so happy, I need to drink. I have no one to listen to me, so that I feel left out, so that I need to drink. Um, so, uh, that is called infatuation. Now when it comes to infatuation, there are three areas of, three life areas where we get infatuated. Uh, youthfulness, health and life. Youth, health, life. So uh, these are the, so we, we, we use a, a strong response in these three life areas. Or you could say three areas of life. And that is where the, that is for the contributive tendency. Contributive tendency means you use uh, in these three areas of life, you use infatuation as uh, a tendency. It's a natural tendency. So it is called a contributive contributive tendency of infatuation because it is infatuation that you use. You use that infatuation tendency to deal with your. Um, problems, life situations. So
So simply because that in tendency of in infatuation uh, contributes towards a lot of problems for, uh, in the long run, you call it uh, the contributive tendency of infatuation. Now the first life we look at the youthfulness, youth. And then uh, when you are young, of course not when everyone is young here, um, so that uh, I'm not a sweet talker. Um, so uh, when when you are very young, uh, you always convince yourself what is that. So uh, you do the you overuse the your physical strength. You overbelieve. You believe. You believe in. Uh, the ability to overuse your physical strength. That is what you do. Uh, uh, that is because of uh, your youthful infatuation. Or oh, I'm young. I can. My body can stand anything. I have met so many people who believe that anything thing. In prison, uh, sorry, in drug addiction counseling, also young people. So, uh, and then you believe that your body, as a young man, young person, uh, young woman, you can, uh, your body can stand anything. So you got, that is called youthful infatuation. You got infatuated, you got intoxicated by your youthfulness. Because you uh, um, think that you can overuse your physical strength. In fact, you don't even use, think about overusing. It's normal to you. You through infatuation. At, the, at this point, I, f I will first ex explain these uh, uh, stormy three life areas um, under the, the term stormy response. So that, uh, so that why this is called stormy response? Uh, your, your body, even though you don't feel it, uh, your body feels like that it is caught up in a storm. So that uh, because you are so young, you would you wouldn't uh, tend to believe that. It takes you uh, uh, probably a long period of time to understand that uh, you had tortured your physical body, that you had uh, overused your physical strength. That is when you uh, close to uh, those who have uh, the higher the the level of youthful infatu infatuation that you had when you were young, uh, the longer the medical, uh, how to say, medical condition that you have to suffer with when you reach middle age. Right. So, uh, and that is when I recently, when I was in Sri Lanka, I took some of my friends for a, a liver scan. Right. Uh, so that uh, there was one, actually I took one liver patient. I used to be a liver patient too, not anymore. Uh, so I took one of my friends to the hospital. And there was another friend, he asked me whether he could join. I said, you know what, why not get a liver scan? Why not get your liver scan? Oh, no, no you are offending me. I'm good. I, but, but I forced him. I forced him. You know what, it doesn't cost that much money, why not? Uh, when we got the results in 48 hours later, he was the most suffering man that I have ever seen in my life. He got fatty liver and he was a liver damage as well. And then he told me, oh, you are like God sent, you are the Buddha, the God, because you said you forced me into having uh, a liver scan. And uh, to me, it's a perfect and ample example of youthful infatuation. He, he overuses his uh, physical strength, believing that you, the body can stand that. But later in, uh, in, late, later in our life, we could uh, uh, have to uh, face what is called uh, repercussions. And then, uh, so that, uh, that karma, your own bad karma has come back to torture your physical body. If I use the word here, karma, so that the karma returns any time, it can come back any time. And this, that is the first area. So, uh, whenever you feel youthful, 
good. I always like people to feel youthful. I always recommend people that always make yourself appear very young. I mean, if you have money, you can go extra miles and have plastic surgery, whatever. It's none of my business, right? I have to do with that. And people have asked me if it's okay to have plastic surgery, cosmetic surgery. Why not if you have money? Is it okay or not? Don't ask, don't, don't get me say yes or no. It's up to you. But still, you need to uh, love your physical body. If you really love your physical body, um, you don't overuse your physical strength. And in family counseling, I have come up with this too. And then uh, one day uh, in the stage, I was, uh, because I work with, uh, uh, how to say, police emergency line. So that uh, when there's some domestic violence, the police would try uh, to help the family uh, to deal with that without getting booked into the, uh, get, uh, so that, uh, without getting charged. And so that they asked their religion at times, and they asked, okay, we need a Buddhist monk, priest. So I got the phone call, emergency call, then I went there, right? And so that when I went there, then I asked, there was a uniform officer as well, and then I, but I had the permission from the officer to have, talk to them in Sinhalese, native language. Usually we are supposed to talk to them, them in English, because one family member had difficulty with the language, because I had to record everything. But it never goes to the police uh, books, uh, record. Um, so, and then uh, the husband told me, uh, well, so, uh, uh, and it was a, a sexual violence case. And he had, he would torture her uh, to, to an extent that nobody would even believe. And she lived with that for a few years. And then because she couldn't stand that anymore, and then she wanted, uh, she, she called the police. But so, still, due to uh, cultural reasons, um, both parties never wanted the rest of the community to know that. Right? It's a cultural thing too, because I always think about the cultural, uh, cultural basis of uh, uh, violence. And so that then I talked to them. So I'm here to uh, explain you, uh, the point to you. Now, uh, when I talked to the husband, he told me that uh, I assume that uh, my wife likes get to get tortured. I said, well, I don't have an active sex, sex life, but I know lots of stories because I study sexual ethics in the university. Uh, as part of my program, in religious studies program, we had to study sexual ethics. But there are some people who do that uh, with each other's consent. I mean, torturing each other for sex, uh, sex for the purpose of uh, sex. But at this point, uh, it's not. But he said that, uh, well, I think that is her weakness. She should be, her body should be able to stand that. If I can do, why not her? So, that's more to, to the story, but I'm, I'm going to stop at this point. Um, so, uh, and then I have counseled some people who got sick later in their life because of uh, uh, because of the fact that they tortured their physical body. Uh, so during uh, uh, sex, we had to study the sexual ethics class. So otherwise, I was living in in the country. How could I help people? Right? The people have shared with me uh, their stories, secrets in a way that uh, certain stories are untold and you wouldn't believe it's incredible stories. Uh, there are incredible stories of on the way we deal with our physical body. And then, uh, but in traditional lots of people, once I talked about uh, uh, the necessity to take care of our physical body, and somebody asked me, Bhante, uh, everything is impermanent. I think I am, that's the, I think I have to suffer. Meditate on the impermanent nature of my body. Okay, you do that. So what's the problem here? Well, you know what? Everything is impermanent so that uh, I don't have to think about my physical body. And then I said to him, no. Uh, physical body is a gift. You have to love it. You have to take care of it. And then, uh, so, 
why not take care of your physical body when you are young and strong rather than complaints against physical pains when you are in old age then uh, then you come then you want to dedicate allocate all your time to do uh, uh, to meditating on the impermanent nature of your physical body right? but that is not the application of impermanence at that point it is simply your wishful thinking it's not it's not buddhist to do that it's unbuddhist to do that so that is uh, a youthful infatuation. Next one is uh, health infatuation. That is uh, belief that illness will not strike me. That is that is those that is how people living with uh, people who live with uh, health infatuation justify uh, their their wanting their tendency. Um, to uh, uh, sort of involve the physical body in the name of happiness, joy. I mean, it comes to it is pretty much similar to youthfulness. But regardless, I mean, it comes to uh, health infatuation. Your age doesn't matter. So that uh, even no matter how old you are, when you are not ill. Overall, you, you have your physical fitness and you are not sick. And what you do that is you get infatuated. Hey, 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 I'm now 75 at this age. All my colleagues are, they are, almost, they have, they are collapsing now. Whereas I am the one. I can, I can be much stronger than a young man. Right? So that is the health infatuation. But don't over trust. Uh, don't trust your that infatuation. Uh, the tenderness of infatuation. All these things Buddha have recommended a stormy response. And you storm your physical body uh, with the health infatuation. Again, the body has to uh, go through some storms. <coughs> and again, it's a tornado, hurricane. And then your body has to go through lots of turbulence. Yeah, that's the word, turbulence. Yeah, the body has to go through turbulence. When you are or when you overuse your physical strength because you are youth, infatuated with youthfulness and so that uh, the body has to go through turbulence and when you are inter, uh, infatuated with health and uh, so that you never think about how old you are and you only you believe in good health but you for, for the moment you forget that body has to go through all the sufferings, all the turbulence that you would otherwise you would create, and you forget that. So the body has to go through lots of turbulence because of health. So the 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 definition of health in situation is that you believe that illness will not strike me. Illness will never strike me. Um, so uh, because the body can, even though the mind Mind has no limits, whereas the body does. The body can, the physical body cannot stand everything that you that you do because of your mental strength. Because all this uh, this tendency is mental, um, so this uh, contribute to respond uh, tendency uh, regarding uh, youthfulness, health, and next one life. So you can raise the convince that you can overuse your physical strength that you will never get uh, ill, sick. Um, so the one day you will die a very healthy life. Right? That's what people think. And then the third one is life. Mm. Now this one, how, how different is life infatuation uh, from youthful and health infatuations? That is, uh, you can see that from the definition, the Buddhist definition. When you are, life infatuation is when you are overly optimistic because the Buddhist definition of life is so, so our life uh, our thinking so uh, you have to be optimistic because simply because you are not supposed to be pessimistic 
But life has to be seen as something that is neither optimistic nor pessimistic but realistic in terms of the approach. Overall, we have uh, an optimistic approach to our life. The higher the optimism, the next moment, the higher the pessimism. It's like you, the higher you go, right, when you fall, you, it hurts more. It takes long, more and longer and deeper. So, uh, so the in, when you have life infatuation, you are overly optimistic or overly pessimistic, both. Why do you become pessimistic? Actually, optimism and pessimism are the two sides of the same coin. So that, uh, interestingly, in, in, in the Buddhist psychology, in, in Buddhist perspective, um, so that you are optimistic, that you are optimistic means, that you are pessimistic means, you are passively optimistic. That you are pessimistic means, you are passively optimistic. How, how is that possible? Oh, this is how it is. Now, you broke up with your friend this morning. And then what happens? And then you came to the temple and started talking about, talking about your friends with me. A lot. You also shared uh, both good, fond and painful memories of your partner, for, for, um, your friend turned opponent. And then, um, and you had never spoken with me. You had never talked to me about your friends like, like that before. And then you, let's say, usually you only spend five minutes to talk about, uh, talk to me about your partner, friend, while this morning you, you, not, you, you still, you talk to me about like three hours, but you still wanted to talk to me, continue with that. Uh, so why is that? You are in your dormant mind, uh, so that you relive you really reactivate, revalidate uh, the fond memories of your friendship. Now that you have broken up with your friend, but still you are not willing to accept that. And you continue to validate, validate uh, the lost, so the ended relationship, friendship, in uh, negative terms. You use the negative terms, so that passive, but actually there is hope. There is hope in your dormant mind. So that is why you talk about them. So that is when I uh, say, so optimism. Pessimism is the passive optimism. You are passively optimistic. You have, you have disconnected. There's disconnection between you and your friend. So, but still, you talk about it. And uh, if I, you can really justify that you talk about them, you, uh, your former friend, because uh, he was not supposed to leave, they, he or she was not supposed to leave, either because uh, of uh, the fact that uh, uh, you were very honest in your relationship. Uh, so, whichever, you could be the, the wrong party, or he or she could be the, the wrong party, but still, whichever the case, whichever the situation, whichever the outcome, you still talk about, you love to talk about uh, him or her. That is because of pessimism. Pessimism. So, but overall, when you accept both situations, now uh, you got life infatuation means you are overly optimistic. I have come across some people; they are unrealistically, incredibly over pessimistic. As over, overly optimistic. The over optimism means incredible. I have come across some people. Unbelievable. But, uh, the moment something petty, something happens to them, um, for example, recently someone uh, uh, called me from Paris, and then uh, that someone, I'm not going to say uh, male or female, that someone told me that he, uh, they felt embarrassed, right? So that those are... Uh, you could say they, because it was someone, somebody. So that somebody, so they told me that uh, they felt embarrassed in the train, on the train. Okay. So uh, then I asked why. 
because Bhante, I broke my uh, uh, sandals, my, 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 uh, my, my shoes. So that, and I thought, look, everyone was looking at me. I cried. So you cried because you broke your shoe? Uh, yes. Um, so that is to, to, that, to, that, to my friend who lives in France. He always uh, maintained, okay, if you live in France, especially Paris, you have to be absolutely optimistic, romantic, everything, orderly. And I said, I met lots of homeless people in Paris. So, but that is his fascination. That is his, uh, his, per uh, his perception. Now, because he is from a rich family and he would wear the best things, he would have the best comfort in his life. Right? Did I say his? Yeah. So, uh, yes, so that, uh, uh, so that it was a big problem in his life. When you, uh, Overall, when you have you, when you haven't encountered negative life situations in life, you find it extremely difficult uh, to uh, uh, to cope with even uh, very unimportant little life situation, negative situation. Some people cry, some people uh, cry a lot because the, for the first time they miss their breakfast. Some people cry because they have never had good food for, uh, for during their life. So, to me, uh, before me, uh, they shed an uh, equal amount of uh, tears. Uh, so that uh, they, they take the same amount, same amount of time to lament uh, their situation. But it's always two different stories. And then, uh, let's say who, somebody who missed his breakfast for the first time away from home, family, right? he would cry, they would cry. But to him, at that point, that is the biggest problem. Right? Always, my problem is the biggest problem in the world. Your problem? I have no regard to that. I have, it's, not, it's none of my business. My problem is the problem in the world. The problem. There's only one problem. If there is a problem in the world, that is my problem. So that is, that's how I think. Why? That is because of our overly optimistic approach to life. When your approach to life is overly optimistic, and that, uh, that can uh, bring you problems in the long run. And the opposite is the same thing. When you are, some people are overly pessimistic. They always, I'll start their expressions, statements with no. No, I don't think so. Because I have lots of my friends, annoying friends. So even if I help them with pocket money, and they will say, okay, uh, can we go, can we have a road trip next week? I can drive, you can drive. No. Well, then I can drive, I will drive, you can, you, you sit. Well, no. But you, you are not doing anything right now, you are just at home. Well, but you know what? No, because that's how people are. You might have seen that in, in companies, at workplaces, in teamwork, um, in, uh, in the temple, in church, in social groups. Always there is one, someone, who to talk first and say no. Most of these annoying people, the negative people, they speak first. They want the first chance and they do everything possible to discourage everyone else. And then when they when you look at look into their life into their life, actually they always feel marginalized and left out. While well, you are trying to pull them out of that. But they are not willing to come out. Dark room syndrome. Uh, so emotional emotional dark room. So when it comes to life also you could be either, now the infatuation at this point again, like in health and youth areas, um, uh, life infatuation, when you are, when you have, like when you suffer from life infatuation, it is uh, much more harmful than 
youthful and healthy infatuation. Because I have come across children, little children, kids. They are very negative. So, unfortunately, when I spoke to them, uh, in most cases, parents, are, parents must be held responsible. I know that a lot. At times, I have to, when the child wants to uh, build a, a highway to happiness, First, I have to do lots of groundwork. I have to find, I have to cut down the trees, level the ground, uh, and build the highway, and buy him the car. I mean, I had to first counsel the parents. I had to rectify everything right from the ABC, right from the beginning. I had to rectify the whole thing. It, then it becomes a, it, it has been a chronic thing as well. And so this is a collective, collective uh, that's the other point here. It could be uh, uh, due to peer pressure as well. Especially when it comes to uh, life infatuation, I have seen lots of families that live with that. Because uh, uh, if, especially I have seen that in uh, criminal families, drug addict, drug addict families, and also these uh, entertainment addicted families, Everything is entertainment, that's true. But actually, you have to be very rational as well. So that uh, entertainment pleases your emotions. But in real life, you have to deal with bill paying, making money, education, survival skills and all that. So, and then when it comes to, especially life infatuation. So, uh, any... Uh, before I uh, explain the sunshiny response, any questions? Uh, can you explain how uh, this situation affects children? Mm -hmm. how, how oh yeah, right, yeah. Actually, nowadays it is, sorry to say that it's due to scientific, uh, how to say, uh, the advanced technology and science and uh, access to. Nowadays, because uh, children have too much access to uh, uh, entertainment, like the computer games, uh, entertainment, and then people don't have a social life. They have no time to engage with the nature. That well, when I was a kid, I would uh, play cricket and some of the local sports in, in my childhood uh, before becoming a monk. And then we would do arts and crafts and travel and then, uh, so, and we would do a uh, clean up, uh, so the sessions and all that. So that nowadays, uh, people, uh, uh, due to the overuse of social media, and then the availability uh, of um, uh, too much access to uh, comfort, uh, youth, uh, uh, so the children get infatuated with all of this. Like, uh, because they don't sleep at all, and the children get insomnia, because that's uh, as far as youthful. When it comes to children, that is their, that's the best example. Well, I'm, mom, dad, you go to bed, you're old, you need, and because you have to go to bed next, because I'm young, but you have to go to school, well, I will wake up on time. But what if you, uh, but I have to wake up you, wake you up, but still, even if you don't, I can wake up. It's a story that uh, it's, a, it's, it's a big battle in the morning, I have lots of parents have told me. So that is, that is how it affects, and when it comes to health also, when I use, work with uh, youthful offenders, drug offenders, abusers, um, so that uh, this time also we, we, I attend this, because that's one of my favorite a counseling areas, especially in the US, this time I did that in Sri Lanka. I couldn't believe that how the youth got addicted to drugs, school children, and I worked with, I attended uh, some uh, sessions uh, uh, organized by the police, local police department. So, and they get uh, overall, nowadays children, children, overall children are infatuated with life because they don't, they, are, they have no chance to see their future. Because whereas when it comes to youthful infatuation, health infatuations, usually you are, you are halfway through your adulthood. 
whereas when it comes to the infatuation of life in the case of children they are faced with they are already faced with an uncertain future because to them there's no vision there's no future they don't feel like and then you enjoy for the moment so that uh, and then uh, and then as a result because uh, this time when i was in sri lanka i attended uh, four funerals of young men one was 18 the other two of them 19 other one 21 you know what what happened uh, two of them had a heart attack young men why is that they would eat all the fast food and then drink and sleep long hours um so uh, and why that why is that we are young youthful infatuation and then also health infatuation i am young my body can stand anything so uh, but uh, uh so whereas when i talked to some of their friends they were shocked to see this, to see their friends uh, are now dead and uh, and they rushed to talk to me well but the uh, i think we need we need to learn we can believe that he is gone and then because because i can use within my personal culture i could use certain terms that you would find uh, not suitable then i said okay um lucky you you came to talk to me otherwise i know i know want to uh, i know on you to follow him meaning i know on them to die that soon so it is such a thank you it is a very tactical question that's because of the uh how to say the time that we live is very different and then uh, so uh, some people died while taking selfies all over the world that's called selfie deaths and at the same time uh, some kill themselves because they don't have access to a smartphone to take selfies <laughs> Hmm? Age group. Uh, age groups are um, 12 to 19. 12 to 19, because due to hormonal growth, and they think about their so image. They think about physical image, but now in this technologically and advanced, you have access to social media, and we are we are social media fed, social media trained. our food is social media facebook i saw and this month too <laughs> yeah. before someone else tell me you as well right so but i have control over that control i use the facebook to uh, uh teach people uh to uh, make friends make uh, like minded groups and so that we can discuss dharma our uh, limits in our life limitations and all that so uh, and then yes so that is that is what about young people now we have third minute let's discuss uh, the other kind of response some shy response right as opposed to storm so as you say it is calm after the storm so it is the sunshine again after the heavy stormy rain because when i came up with these two terms i was so happy why because i had to encounter a lot of uh, uh, terrible hurricanes uh, in in florida and then when it was the sunshine and then the, even though the people got all their properties uh, destroyed they perished almost anything uh, in the in the storm and they were so happy to uh, Uh, flock together and congregate together in the public safe areas and to, to enjoy and then they were simply the sun is back so sunshiny according to etymology or etymological also right? sunshiny means calm tranquil is the calm response what is meant by sunshiny what we mean by sunshiny response is meditative response That the alternative term, meditative response. Now, when you have storm response, you terrorize your physical body. 
in uh, you in when you use the sunshine response, the meditative response, you comfort your physical body. You simply you give your body a smooth touch. You touch your body smoothly. Uh, whereas in a storm, in stormy, uh, we, through, uh, when you uh, with a stormy response, uh, you can uh, you can even damage your physical body. Now, uh, when it comes, uh, sorry, but I have to go. From time I will go back to uh, the stormy response when I explain sunshine response. Now, when you are first, you start using drugs, and you are very months, uh, months, in months into your addiction, and then uh, so that's another way that you uh, that you make yourself happy. You cut yourself. You cut yourself. At times, some people completely amputate their limbs, and they simply want to see the blood. And so that is stormy. So the stormy response could end up uh, in uh, making yourself, uh, destroying your own selfhood, your your physical body. Whereas in when you use uh, meditative response, uh, you give your body a break. That's the way it has to do. So that uh, when you become busy and busy busier and busier, it only takes away the remaining peace. It only drains your energy. Whereas, when you uh, give your physical body a break through meditation, that is called meditative response, sunshine response. I learned this technique from the Buddha. And then at times, he would go to solitude. In solitude, you don't feel lonely. Loneliness and solitude are two different things. Solitude is a created situation. Loneliness is an automatically created So solitude is a purposely created uh, situation, condition. Whereas loneliness is automatically uh, a condition, life condition that is created by your uh, own, because of your own irresponsible uh, approach to life. So, and then I, when you read the Buddha's uh, biography, you see that at times uh, Buddha would, uh, even though he had a daily routine, at times uh, he would go uh, into solitude and he would meditate under a tree. In you know, if it's a, uh, if he lives, and he would go to a, a forest clearing. If he lives in a forest come out of the forest and go to the sunshine and meditate. So sunshine, sunshine medi- uh, approach means that you create purpose or create some space within your mind first because you need to, you, you don't, you have to feel like doing that. And then you choose a physical, the suitable physical surroundings and, and go and uh, be yourself, meaning meditate. And in, in another, another technical term, for some shiny uh, so uh, response is uh, so this uh, mm, uh, bio so the uh, so bio calming response meaning you take your physical body into calmness into calm into med- through meditation you you tranquilize your physical body and at that point you are your purpose is not uh, the peace of mind, but the peace of your body. So you need to give your body, physical body, a rest. So Buddha has, Buddha doesn't, he doesn't have worries anyway. So Buddha doesn't have to think about uh, stress or the frustration of his mind because he's enlightened. But why he still take a break? He takes a break because he want to let the let his physical body rest. So, even if you love, some people have told me that they may want to meditate because they are peaceful and their mind is clear. What about your body? Well, it's, well, it comes to body, I have this pain, that pain, this ache, that ache, this condition, I am on prescription, uh, I take this and that medi- medicine, 
Okay, that time, because that's it. So, even if you don't really meditate, why not then uh, uh, go to a quiet area and drink a lot of water and then uh, so uh, do deep breath because deep breath involves your, uh, your physical body. That is why when it comes to calm, calm meditation, tranquility meditation, almost everyone finds breath meditation, meditation on breathing the best because it involves a physical body. So the entire session is concerned, is dedicated to discussing uh, uh, our physical body, not our mind. Because always the body is the victim. The body falls victim to our uh, mind, our improper tendencies. So, uh, and then uh, when you, you need to have personal time, Everyone needs personal time because just as you discuss your problems with your family members or co-workers or friends, at times you are not supposed to talk, uh, you are not supposed to be talking or sharing, verbally sharing your problems with others. Instead, you need to have, you need to make personal time and go to a quiet place and never to talk to anyone, never to have anyone. So. And then, then to so and then have to meditate. So this meditative or the sunshine response is the opposite of dark room, dark room uh, approach. Instead of locking yourself up in a dark room so that so that you, you may sure that no one can see you, no one can approach you. Uh, you when when you use this uh, approach, this response, so meditative response you go to public, uh, open, open place. So, uh, if you have a history of uh, um, dark room um, syndrome, whatever, and don't meditate in your room. Why? And then, uh, so that you will revalidate your negative history. And instead of uh, being positive, and you would reinforce yourself again, um, with your negative history, so uh, that's why it's recommended that you go to uh, you go out and go to uh, uh, so the you go to the sun, go to uh, a place where you can uh, have uh, sunshine. So uh, and also Florida is a, is called sunshine state, right? And most of uh, elderly people, especially these people from Canada, snowbirds. Uh, they have a house, second house uh, in, in Florida. Right? They call it Sunshine State. But in, su in the Sunshine State, that is my home state, I always see people who live in the dark room. They don't enjoy the sun. Uh, they don't, they hate to enjoy the sun. Because in a western country like this, people are waiting for the sun. Right? When it's sunny, that's why you uh, uh, the people uh, Government or agencies uh, spend lots of money, invest lots of money for uh, weather. Right? Whereas when it's all tropical throughout, right, you don't, uh, you don't realize, you don't uh, appreciate that. I noticed that in in, in in Florida, especially in Miami, people are people in Miami are heavy coffee drinkers. Drink lots of coffee and tea, and they uh, they sing. Singing is good, it's a therapy. Coffee drinking is good, it's entertaining. But they don't do anything else, but that's all they do throughout the year. Um, so, now, that is not sunshine, uh, sunshine response. Actually, in the sun, in the sunshine, you live in the, in the dark. I mean emotionally. So the sunshine approach means you have to make new friends. You have to make new connections to uh, toward of the dark, the darkness from your life. You need to have make new connections because uh, um, so there are lots of opposition from your regular friends, but that's okay. So whenever you feel like uh, getting negative heat, negative karma from your regular friends, then 
why not uh, be go to a quiet place and then meditate you don't have to do long long meditate for long hours but you simply uh, drink some water and then uh, do some deep breath and just walk around uh, but lots of people have told me that before uh, doing that they would uh, call their family members and your friends what happens is they want to join you and it's another typical annoying uh, uh, reunion that's not the way to do that while you tell your immediate family members where you go for for safe to reasons but it's always worth uh, uh, you need to make your own personal time most people if you can make time to go to a party entertainment dinner dance why not make time to have some meditation it's all at least to go to a library if you hate being in the outdoor why not go to a library or a museum i always recommend that. it's a therapy so some shiny response i do that a lot so last night i had to do exam so from 9 pm to uh, 7 a.m. this morning i did my assignment didn't sleep a minute so after breakfast i know the people were bringing in delicious lunch but i said to uh, the sangha i'm not coming out for lunch instead i never want to eat anything again i drank instead i drank lots of water and slept and gave my body a break so that i never wanted to eat i know i did i didn't feel like eating so uh, and so that i am i have recovered my inner peace right so that's the that's the way i in inside my room i had the uh, some shiny response where as people who live in tropical weather and then they they hate the sun there's a different story as well some people think about the skin burn uh, so that uh, so that is the uh, overall that is the sunshiny uh, response so so far going back to the term the reflective force so the reflective force is uh, a mental force that conditions the physical body reflective force and uh, any questions yes Uh, yes if you uh, it depends on how gritty you are how gritty you are how determined you are thank you very much that you can create the situation so you create uh, you create the inner space for yourself actually i know lots of people who do that but in so doing um you need it friends even some of family members uh, would not approve that but you are not going to kill yourself as you are going to uh, uh, you are going to survive um so uh, that is a fascinating question because you might have noticed that uh, people in our inner circles they always try to drag out drag us into negative things whereas when you suggest that you do something positive that that would benefit the entire circle and always that annoying one comes opens up and first no no you know it's that's not good you don't have to do that so and when you plan when you plan thank you my friend for that question i like that question when you plan uh, don't tell anyone that's a saying in buddhism even if you are willing to be the buddha don't tell your friends that's a story as well um this one of the canonical text called uh, questions of king minander minander was a greek indian king and it is a semi canonical text in buddhism if you want to study buddhism in q q and a manner q and a form uh, is available in this translation might be available online too it's a huge sub canonical semi canonical text uh, question milind the panya questions of king minander minander was a greek indian king so he met one uh, arahant called uh, nagasena So Nanda Sena was lived in India. Minanda lived in uh, so the Greek part of ancient India. So that he was he was Western. Um, so that uh, he was Hellenistic. 
He was a Hellenistic king, according to Miranda. So that what happened? In one of their previous lifetimes, previous verse, they were novice monks. And then, um, so Nagasena, when the Nagasena, in his previous life, he was very smart. And then both were now, uh, uh, so that uh, cleaning the temple grounds. They, they clean the temple grounds and then so that uh, and then so so the temple was now beautiful very attractive uh, so that uh, then Venerable Nagasena the Nagasena the novice monk he got um, uh, so as how to say uh, uh, a fistful of uh, sand and he threw it uh, into the space sky and then said so that uh, I am not, I don't know, it, it is thousands, you know, he cut a fistful of pebbles and he threw them into the sky. I don't know how many are there, but still, uh, just like uh, it is uncountable by the good karma that I made by cleaning the temple grounds, may I have the best wisdom in the world when I come back in my, nobody should be able to beat me. Nobody should be able to outsmart me, outshine me in knowledge, in wisdom, in arguments, in debates. He, he was so excited that he said that too loud. And there was another monk, the other monk, who would be the king men under this lifetime, he said. No matter how knowledgeable he is going to be, no matter how wise he is going to be, I should be able to counter him. I should be able to argue with him. I should be able to debate with him. So that is why according to their karmic connection, uh, so they are in their final birth. Um, so uh, the, son, the novice monk who uh, made that aspiration, uh, he became uh, venerable now, he became an enlightened monk. And the other one was uh, so powerful and he, he became a king. So that is, that is the story, their past life story behind. And when I heard the story from my mother, when I was a child, he told me, even if you want to be the Buddha one day, don't tell your friends. Do, 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 do your things yourself. So I, I, I got, I got more motivated by the story. Now, actually we need, uh, and Buddha once recommended uh, to one of the princes, Bodhiraja. The Bodhiraja was afraid of taking over his father's business when the father was too old. And he was rich, Prince Bodhiraja. And Buddha was invited to their palace and Buddha said that uh, if you think negatively like that, you, sh you, you will never be able to take over the business. You are already negative. And then so that you need to change your friends, make new connections, be positive, learn from positive people because you are the one to take over the business. You take over the father's business. Buddha told that that's called lifestyle change. That is the term that I want to touch on lifestyle change and then when you in when you make decisions at times you are not supposed to tell anyone else. It's always good to uh, prove yourself uh, after you have uh, achieved your goal. Otherwise halfway through uh, in, in most cases people want us to fall. How to tell? They want us to fall. I I haven't fallen, but there was a time that I would share everything, even my plans. Right? And so that is when say, okay, uh, and those who uh, spoke to me about that, and they believe in, they were ardent believers in karma. Because when you say to them, when you share your plans in advance, and they become jealous, and you have to face their negative karma. Whether it's karma or not, anything, but in certain cases, I uh, I never shared my plans. I never shared. Suppose the person who gives the advice mm -hmm. is a Kalyan mitra, that will be okay. Yes, that's that's uh, that's another thing. Thank you, thank you. Uh, actually, I was going to say that that was the last thing I was planning to say. You read my mind. Um, uh, when it, even if we are comfortable and we. We feel we 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 have uh, enough self confidence to have this uh, sunshiny approach and uh, to make a lifestyle change, 
change our lifestyle and uh, so that we can uh, be realistic. Uh, at times, you alone cannot do that. You need uh, assistance from uh, a good friend. That's called, as he said, Kaladharamitta, or the trustworthy spiritual friend. He has to be a trustworthy friend. Not a friend uh, who is, uh, who, uh, who make you read your story on CNN, BBC, uh, 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 whatever this uh, well-known uh, website meaning gossiping. Uh, so that, uh, and then it has to be a trustworthy friend. So trustworthy that uh, they wouldn't share your personal stuff with others. They wouldn't disclose. If he said, good friends never disclose your personal things, your plans, anything, whatever you share with them, they never disclose to anyone. And a trustworthy friend, for example, there are three people, uh, you, me and you, so with we three people, right? So I have a problem. Now I share, share it with you, you are my trustworthy friend. And so that, but the friendship between you and him is much stronger than between the one between me and you. But in the case, given your position, given the position between uh, us, because you are my trustworthy friend, so I trust you more than I trust him, suppose. So that, that's why I share my problems with you. But again, the, the connection between you and him is much stronger than the connection between him and me and him, you and me. That point, uh, so, no matter how close you are, you still, you never share, disclose my information to him. So that's called a trustworthy friendship. Because I have, <coughs> I, I know some people, it's always good to say that too. You can take the role, you can play the role of a trustworthy friend. Actually, some people, uh, I enjoy that a lot. And then, uh, there's one, one well-known personality in a certain country, he passed away two years ago and then uh, he, he encountered some legal problems in the country. So he had to go to prison three months and still he, his family doesn't know that he was in the prison. He was behind bars for th three months. Why? I'm the only one who knows the story and I'm never going to t uh, tell this to share this to disclose, uh, especially because now he's gone, it would be ruthless to share that. But even if he asked me and I told him one, okay, in case you become, I become, you become my enemy and I wouldn't still disclose your information. Why? Because uh, we discussed that it happened to you when we were friends. So it happened and then I made that promise as a friend. It's a different that you, that you are my opponent now, but still, I am compelled to uh, compelled not to disclose your information. So that is how a, a trustworthy friend must uh, behave. So we need, yeah, we need the assistance of uh, a trustworthy friend. We ourselves, but again, overall, on daily basis or at least weekly basis, you need to revisit your uh, indulgences, your habits, uh, your uh, your favorite stuff and revisit them and uh, see uh, uh, whether so that uh, you have been happy overall, whether you have taken wrong approach, whether you have done the wrong thing, believing that uh, it would uh, be otherwise bring you happiness. And so always, that is always recommended uh, to go to a quiet place and to use the meditative approach, to do the meditative response. You respond to whom, what? You respond to your physical body. Because the whole session today is dedicated, was dedicated to talking about uh, our responsibility towards our physical self, with our physical body. So we need to use that sunshine response, uh, meaning a meditative response. So we need to give our physical body a break. And then uh, in, in uh, addiction counseling also in, in different countries, uh, so, some people hate to, some drink heavy, some alcoholics hate to talk to priests, whichever the religion they come from. Why? When they say that the most hateful thing to them, uh, to the addicts means, when they say, okay, drinking is uh, sinful. 
But I never say that. What I do that is, according to, uh, the, according to as per the Buddhist psychological guidelines, because uh, when I have an addiction, so I am the one, uh, I am the best person to know that, to know how hard it is to uh, overcome that addiction. So that whenever I come across people who have addictions, let's say they drink uh, 24-7, um, so I ask them uh, to skip drinking one day, most probably Wednesday, Thursday. Uh, and when I say that, when I recommend that, meaning uh, I can drink till the rest of the week. Well, well, you already got that. I ask you not to drink on Wednesday. So that they don't drink on Wednesday. Uh, wake up early morning and uh, shave and clean their clothes, do laundry, uh, dress up nice and then talk to their family members because uh, throughout the week they have been mindless drinking. And so that uh, lots of family um, uh, spouses have told me, Bhante thanks you, we had a second honeymoon. And for the first time uh, my spouse uh, had a friendly chat with my, our children. Or uh, it was the first time many many months that uh, my spouse looked at my face. Uh, so we had we cooked dinner together, lunch together, and we ate. So that is that is how to start actually, to start the the breaking point. Because our negative, we get uh, our negative uh, how to say the stormy response is at times is the chronic condition. And that know that we, we know that we are in the red zone of dep even depress depression. Even though we are aware, we are not willing to walk away, to, uh, to pull ourselves, ourselves out of that. But it's always good to choose the right time uh, so, uh, to deal with your addictions. Even if you are addicted to gossiping, addicted to drinking, addicted to games, addicted to social media, addicted to uh, uh, so uh, selfies. Uh, and why not yourself get, get addicted to being yourself? Uh, but not by drinking, but by walking to the sunshine. Thank you.